bit, and we're having to leap through what is a, a giant story. Uh, the the crash, uh, Los Angeles, the Kieran. It's a crazy race to start with, and you copped well, almost the worst that could possibly happen out of a Kieran. Yeah, just about. The Kieran's a pretty crazy race, um, but it's a bloody fun race. Uh, it's really great to be a part of. It's a great spectators event. Pretty much, it's it's a little bit like yeah, the trot, a bit like you know, they kind of paced in and then they, they, they pull off. A little bit like that in the sense that there's six riders on the track. We're paced up to speed by a motorbike. The motorbike pulls off at about 55 k's an hour with two lap, two and a half laps to go, and it's mad dash to the finish line. There's six women on on the track, all trying to control the race, all trying to ride to their strengths and not their not their weaknesses. So it gets really really chaotic. Unfortunately for me, I clipped the wheel of a rider um, seven months out from the Olympics at a World Cup in Los Angeles and hit the deck, hit the deck quite quite severely. Um, I don't remember a lot of the fall. I remember thinking that I was going to fall um, and that the 14-hour flight home in economy was really going to suck. Because <laughs> uh, you get really stiff after you hit the deck. Um, but yeah, crashes happen all the time. And the way that I fell in Los Angeles, that sort of thing happens all the time. Never did I think that I would end up in a hospital being told that I'd, I'd fractured my C2 vertebra and I'd broken my neck ultimately and would require 10 weeks in a neck brace. And, um, that sort of news really does kind of instill fear. It instills doubt. And I really felt like my world had just kind of been turned upside down because all of, for the past three and a half years, I've been preparing and training since Athens to go to Beijing. Um, unfortunately, the time trial which I won in Athens was removed, so I only had one event. All my eggs were in one basket, and now I didn't even have a basket. Um, but, you know, my head, even though it was very difficult to get around and, and understand and emotionally control the situation, I was just more focused on Beijing. I was like, well, seven months to Beijing, ten weeks in a neck brace, at least four and a half months of some sort of, you know, I could, I could work for four and a half months to still be in condition to be in contention in Beijing. And that's what my mind was focused on. It wasn't focused on, I'm scared to get back on the bike, which it was. It wasn't focused on, will I qualify, which it was. Um, it was all Beijing, and I had a great support network that did a lot of the worrying for me so that I could focus on what I needed to do to get there. The rehabilitation was relentless. It was ruthless. I cried two or three times a day just to get through it. Um, physically, emotionally, mentally, it was incredibly draining. But what was at the end of it was worth it for me, and that's what really pushed me through to try and try and achieve it. Ended up getting there and winning silver behind Vicky Pendleton, which significant not for just what I went through, but significant because it would become the only medal won by any Australian cyclist in any discipline at those games. So very important. And in some ways, that silver probably stands for you as up there with any gold that you have got or may get. <laughs> yeah, most definitely. Sometimes, uh, well, for me, the the most important uh, result in my career is, isn't the one where I get to stand on the podium on top. It's you know, measured by what I went through to get there. Well, you raised the name first, Victoria Pendleton. It became, as many of you will know, uh, uh, being interested in cycling of all kinds, it, it became a kind of media saga as well as a track saga. Just, we'll only have time to touch on it today, but just take us through how, well, perhaps the best bit for us is not the, you know, the rubbish headlines, but how you devised a plan, what was it called? It was called the know your enemy, know thine enemy strategy. Take us through that. Victoria is the enemy. What was your attack? <laughs> well, my coach was looking for a way to really kind of engage me to overcome issues that I had with racing Victoria and bring that emotion out of it. And the way that we did that was we, did, we broke Vicky down to stats. We broke Vicky down to numbers, really. So I was no longer dealing with Victoria Pendleton, who I had this history with. I was dealing with a rider who did this, who 90% of the time did this, 50% of the time did that. And I was able to really structure how I raced Victoria off of those stats, rather than off of the experience I'd had with her in the past. And it was quite instrumental in me being able to overcome that and be competitive against her. Um, a race 18 months out from London, we were able to find a slight chink in the armour of Vicky. She couldn't track stand. Uh, and we found that out because I was able to, to defeat her at the world titles that year by performing track stand. So for the next 18 months, we didn't use that, that skill or that tactic again. We further developed it in training on a daily basis, but we started to practice plan B, C, D and E against Vicky 
get races around the world in case I could pull off plan A. But I had to be so prepared to perform that track stand off of no practice at competition. So talk about performance under pressure. Um, I'd been given the first win in London against Vicky. I didn't actually cross the line first. I was given the win off of a relegation. Um, and then I had to force Vicky to the front using the track stand. A lot of people ask me why is a sprint called a sprint when you go so slow? It's because uh, you have to win the sprint, you have to win about 12 different races against six different girls. It's a management of fatigue, it's a management of tactics, all that sort of stuff. Tactics for me, if I can explain it in the form of a car, um, between Victoria and I, I have gears one through five, Vicky has gears two through six. So the slower the race, the better it suited me because my acceleration is much better. The faster the race, the better it suited Vicky because the top end speed is much, much better than mine. So I had to ensure that Vicky wasn't in her strongest position, which was in the back, second position, to use me as a target to generate that top end speed. I had to ensure she was in front, pushing the wind, creating that speed herself, and hopefully make a mistake and be marginally too slow. And that's what happened. We should not, I should not have won by bike length. We were only eight hundredths of a second difference in, in straight line speed. But how we get to speed is what, di what differentiates it. And by exploiting that and controlling the race in that way, I was able to be successful. Uh, we're going to sneak into supplementary because this was a fascinating moment. It's only minutes in your life, but it, it represented a, a massive pinnacle, didn't it? Um, one of the other things that you found through Know Thine Enemy was she wasn't so good at looking back. Yeah, it's a, it's a difficult skill on the track to ride forward whilst looking backwards at your opponent so that you can be able to see and make decisions on what your action needs to be. Um, because she was so good at being in the back position, all of her opponents let her ride there. So she didn't actually practice enough being in the front and looking back. So that was actually something that we exploited as well. Um, we Every time that Vicky drew the back in a competition leading into London, we let her ride there. We didn't try to force her to the front because we knew we didn't want to give away our cars what, what we wanted to play in London. Um, so there's a lot of uh, cloak and dagger stuff going on as well. And that's what's really engaging about the sprint for me because I like to play puzzles and challenge myself in that way. Um, especially against someone like Victoria Pendleton. I mean, six, time, six years straight she was undefeated in that event um, until I was able to defeat her in 2011. So. For those of us who haven't seen Australian stories, some of our international delegates, for instance, what about the, the post-London era? Uh, are you in touch with Victoria? No, I haven't actually spoken to Vicky since London, um, and I wouldn't expect to either. Um, she lives on one side of the world, I live on the other. She, um, she's got an incredible profile, a very busy woman on that side. I, I'm still cycling and busy on, on my side. Um, our paths otherwise wouldn't cross. Um, so I think the Australian story for me personally was actually uh, a chance to close the book on that chapter because I haven't, haven't spoken to Vicky since, still haven't. Um, so that was almost like me and Vicky talking to each other through the Australian story. Sporting legend, wonderful speaker, isn't she? Now, if you'd like to hear more from Anna, she's done some really helpful bike riding safety tips videos and they're on the Motor Accident Commission website.